the account of this domino effect, it is here for us as a warning for whenever we are tempted to take matters into our own hands and drive them forward in our own way. And I suspect each one of us, we know something of that temptation and have seen something of the disastrous results. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And uh, Jonathan, I think one of the things that looking back at even these early stories of the Old Testament remind us is that, you know, we don't sin in a vacuum. And when sin uh, enters the picture and when we sin, it doesn't just impact us, but there can be a domino effect. It, It really impacts those around us as well. Well, I think Abram and Sarai learned that lesson the hard way in the incident that we're going to be looking at today in Genesis chapter 16. Sin is messy, and it makes a mess of relationships, and it impacts other people. I guess we probably know that experientially. We've learned something of that in the real world, but the Bible makes it so clear for us. And it's a sobering lesson in the passage today, but it's hope-filled because it's not the end of the story. I often think with some of these disasters in the life of Abram that, you know, the Bible could have been a very, very short book because God could have given up in Genesis chapter 12 or 13 or, or, or 16 as we are here today. But we look at the Bible and we realize it's really quite a long book and this isn't the end of the story. And our mistakes, our sin, our rebellion... If there's repentance that follows, it doesn't need to be the end of the story, and that's that's a great encouragement. Maybe it's the encouragement that some need to hear today who are listening. Well, I hope that you will keep listening. If that's encouragement that you need today, I hope you will not only listen, but that you will grab a Bible and join us in the book of Genesis. We are in chapter 16 as we begin the message, The Cost of Self-Reliance. Here is Jonathan. I wonder if it ever seems to you that the plans... And the purposes of God are rather slow in coming to fruition. His plans and purposes for the gospel, for the church, for the world, his plans and purposes even for you personally. Gospel progress, it often seems unremarkable, doesn't it? Response, it it often seems meager. Reaching the unreached to the very ends of the earth, it's taking a little bit of time isn't it? And we might well ask, will the job ever be completed? Will the task ever be done? In the personal sphere, perhaps you sense that the Lord has set before you a certain task, a certain responsibility, but it's hard to gain traction with it. He's put it on your heart to serve in a particular way, but the opportunity, it just hasn't presented itself. The door hasn't been opened. You, you feel that it is His will for you maybe to get married but it hasn't happened yet. You believe that he wants you to pray for a loved one, a relative, to come to saving faith, but you've prayed for years and there's been no change of heart. When you and I are called upon to wait for the outworking of the plans and purposes of God, there is a great temptation that often arises. And it is the temptation to take matters into our own hands, to seek to achieve God's purposes in our own way, in our own time, and on our own terms. Genesis chapter 16 is the story of two servants of God, two people of faith who succumb to that very temptation. It's a messy incident. It's a blot on Abram and Sarai's record. It comes to us as a cautionary tale, a warning against taking matters into our own hands when we are tempted to do so. And it's here to highlight for us the sheer grace of God whose plans and purposes will not be derailed and will not be destroyed by the folly of His servants. This story of two believers who attempt to pursue God's purposes in a very human way, it highlights for us, first of all, the domino effect of sin. The story of the life of Abram and Sarai has been a bit of a roller coaster so far as we've traveled through it together in these early chapters of Genesis. There have been some real highs where they have trusted God and walked with Him in costly obedience, responding in faith to the word of promise. There have also been some lows, haven't there? Times of fear and of outright failure. In the grand sweep of their story, Genesis 16 does mark a particular low point. It actually reads like some kind of a Greek tragedy, I think. 
It unfolds as a drama that you, you sort of wince at at every turn. Maybe you've watched a film or read a novel like this. You can just see the key characters walking into disaster, and you want to you cry out to them. You want to shout at the television screen, look, stop this. Don't do this anymore. Pull back from this dreadful plan. Every new move, each fresh compromise, it seems to dig them into a deeper and deeper hole, and you begin to wonder, is there any way out of this thing? The chapter opens on an ominous note. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Given what we know of the promise of God to make of this family a great nation who would bring blessing to the world, this issue is a big issue. This problem is a big problem. Only a few verses ago, God had taken Abram outside to look at the night sky. You remember this moment. To look at the stars of the sky. And he had declared to Abram that his offspring would be as many as the stars above. He had then confirmed his covenant to Abram in that rather dramatic ceremony at the end of the last chapter. The promises of God were ringing in the ears of Abram at the end of Genesis chapter 15. But the hard reality hadn't changed. Abram and Sarai were old and getting older and Sarai was still barren. They had been living in the land of Canaan for a decade now, verse 3. By this time, Abram is in his mid-80s, verse 16. And for Sarai, all of this must have been incredibly tough emotionally and spiritually. The hopes and the expectations of the family, the very promises of God for the future, not only of their family, but of the world, it all rested upon her having a baby. And it simply wasn't ha happening. It hadn't, hadn't happened thus far. And at her age, it seemed impossible. Now, she and Abram were people of faith, remember. They never drifted into agnosticism or atheism. They weren't on the verge of giving up on the God of the covenant, not at all, far from it. But evidently, Sarai could not see how the promises of God were going to be fulfilled unless she and Abram now did something, and did something fairly drastic. And so an idea, it, it occurs to Sarai one day. It was not unheard of in the ancient world for servants to bear children in the place of their mistress if she could not conceive. It, it, it happened from, from time to time. And Sarai, she looked over at her Egyptian servant, Hagar, and in Hagar, she began to see an uncomfortable but an efficient solution to a seemingly impossible problem. And so she put the idea to Abram, verse 2. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. Often when you hear the story of a major disaster, you learn that there were a series of bad moves made by a series of people that combined to create this perfect storm, this domino effect, the, you know, the nuclear reactor. It overheats because of a, well, a problem in engineering and another problem in manufacture, followed by a problem in monitoring and control, followed by an extra element of, of human error. Or, or, or the, the ship, it sinks because of a de design flaw that is compounded by a loading imbalance that is made more dangerous through a navigation error in the midst of a storm. And all that, it comes together to make for a terrible disaster. It is a domino effect. Well, here in Genesis chapter 16, we begin to see the domino effect of a whole series of sinful blunders. And this first one on the part of Sarai, it is such a warning to us, to each one of us. It is a warning to believers who aren't in any way planning or intending to turn our backs on the Lord. And I hope that that's us this morning. We're not planning on doing that. She isn't questioning God's existence. She isn't questioning God's plan. She isn't converting to a pagan religion. She has just grown weary in waiting. Does that sound at all familiar? She's grown impatient, and she has decided that now is the time to take things into her own hands. God doesn't seem to be doing it, so I am going to help him out. I will make this thing happen myself. And her suggestion here, it has to be said, it's not out of step with the culture of the time. These things did take place. We have record of it. But at the same time, this simply isn't God's way. Nowhere has God said that polygamy would ever be his plan. Nowhere has he invited Abram and Sarai to consider this as a real option. 
And so here is the first domino that falls. It falls within the heart and the mind of Sarai. But the next one, it comes right away. Sarai makes her case. And end of verse 3, Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Within a marriage, God gives a husband and a wife to one another to provide counsel and encouragement. And in particular, the husband has a God-given role of giving godly leadership within the family. But rather than counterbalance Sarai's suggestion, rather than speak sense and wisdom into the situation, Abram, he, he just hears the heartache in Sarai's voice. He, he, he feels the urgency of her appeal, and he unquestioningly goes along with a plan. He actually completely abdicates any responsibility for true leadership here. He ducks the opportunity to steer things in a godly direction, to course correct. And here we actually have a, an echo, don't we, of the Garden of Eden, a powerful echo. You remember what happened there? The serpent spoke to Eve, tempted her. She was taken in, and Adam then followed in her sin without raising a single question or an objection. And so, another domino falls. The plan, it's initiated, verse 3. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. The mess, it, it gets more messy. Abram goes along with this plan that he should have lovingly and firmly refused. He abandons his monogamous commitment to Sarai and embraces the polygamy of the surrounding cultures. And this plan, this arrangement, this sin, well, it only opens the door to more sin. The, the next domino, it quickly falls. Hagar duly becomes pregnant. In the middle of verse 4, when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Now, it's hard to imagine all the emotions of Hagar in this situation, how she might have felt in being asked or coerced or even forced into this arrangement. We just don't have a record. But once she conceives, we do now gain some insight into her feelings and her response. She looks with contempt on her childless mistress, respect of any kind, which would have been fitting within the household. Respect for Sarai gives way to smugness and then contempt. Now, Hagar is a wife of Abram, like Sarai is, but she actually has the upper hand because she has produced the much-anticipated heir. Unsurprisingly, Sarai, she feels hurt. She feels humiliated. And an another domino falls. She turns her anger now on Abram, verse 5. May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. It's your fault, Abram. It's all your fault. I let you marry my servant to help the situation move forward. But look what's happened here. The Lord is going to judge, but I know the verdict. You are guilty, Abram. Your fault. Well, we don't want to be too hard on Sarai here in her distress, but we have to acknowledge as well how unreasonable all this seems. <laughs> this was your idea after all, Sarai. You suggested it. You wanted it this way, and it's not like no one could see that this path forward was strewn with rocks and obstacles and dangers. But in any case, the situation has now led to tension and acrimony between Sarai and Abram. And as if things weren't messy enough already, they quickly get worse. Abram responds to this, not with an attempt to speak reason to the situation, not with a gentle rebuttal to the tirade. No, he just redirects Sarai's anger toward Hagar, who is actually fundamentally helpless. Verse 6, behold, your servant, she's in your power, do as you please. Look, Hagar may be my wife now, but she still came into this house as a servant. She came into this house as your servant. Do whatever you want with her. But, but, but Abram, Hagar, she, she needs protecting here. She, she was dragged into this situation. It hardly upheld her freedom or her dignity in the first place. And now to allow her to become a whipping post for the anger of Sarai. Abram, you can't do that. What are you thinking? Now the next domino falls. Sarai does what we anticipate she would do. She deals harshly with her former servant. She deepens her own sin and her own shame by abusing a defenseless woman within her household. And all this, it leads to the falling of one more domino. All this leads to one more unhappy outcome. Hagar flees. 
She runs for it. It's a reasonable response, of, of course. We can hardly fault her for running away. But this sad outcome, it is a bad outcome because despite everything, the blessing of God still rests on Abram and his family and his household. Ultimately, for Hagar to know the blessings of God, the salvation blessings of God, she needs to remain part of the family of faith, however messy that family may be. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called The Cost of Self-Reliance. It's part of a larger series, The Blessing, where we're taking a look at Genesis chapter 16 today. Now, we're going to get back to this message in just a moment, so I hope you'll stay with us. But if you ever miss a broadcast or part of one, you can always come to the website and you can listen online. You can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Just stop by EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. Back to the message. Here is Jonathan. One domino after another, after another, after another. The initial idea, the initial inclination to take matters into human hands, the initial sin, it sets off a cascade of other sins. Sin begets sin here, and things go from bad to worse to worse again. Now, the account of this domino effect, the presentation of this tragic drama before us, it is here for us as a warning it's here as a warning for you and for me in those seasons when the plans of God for the gospel, for the church, for our loved ones, for us personally, when the plans and purposes of God seem slow to come to fruition. It's a warning for us, isn't it, for whenever we are tempted to take matters into our own hands and drive them forward in our own way. And I suspect each one of us here, we know something of that temptation. We know something of that experience, and perhaps you personally have seen something of the disastrous results. Maybe you've seen it, I don't know, in a ministry endeavor. Things aren't coming together as you had expected, as you had planned. The Lord hasn't made the provision. He hasn't brought along the partners. He hasn't opened the door, but you are determined anyway this thing is going to happen. Maybe you've seen it in your evangelism or your discipleship of your loved ones. The, the Lord just, just hasn't yet done the work in their heart that you've been longing He would do. And it's been a long time that you've been praying, and so you decide, okay, now is the time. And, and you push, and you cajole, and the results, they're not pretty, are they? Maybe you've seen it in your personal life. The Lord, He hasn't provided that believing spouse that you've been praying for. And so you think, if, you know, if the Lord won't come through for me, here's what I'll do. I will find a sympathetic non-Christian and I'll just, I'll make it work. And of course, the results, they're messy. This is a real area of temptation and danger for us who know the Lord. It's a subtle temptation. Of course, it is a subtle danger. Remember, Abram and Sarah, they weren't saying, you know, we don't have faith anymore. They weren't saying that the promises of God were not true. They were not wanting to walk away from the Lord or to stop serving the Lord. No, none of the above, not at all. They believed that the promises of God were true. They believed that His plans would come to fruition ultimately. They simply and wrongly assumed that if God seemed slow in working out His purposes, it was right now for them to take matters into their own hands. It was fine for them to employ a shortcut or two. It was appropriate to drive things through by human means. But the results, as we all can see, the results were disastrous. One sin led to another, which led to another, which led to another, and there was carnage at every turn. Pursuing God's plan, humanity's way, it highlights the domino effect of sin. Next, it highlights for us the abundant grace of God. We see God's grace poured out on everyone, really, within this very messy story, and the first of those people is Hagar herself. Just it's hard for us, I think, to imagine how Hagar must have been feeling at this moment when she fled. She had been used. She, she had been abused. She wasn't blameless in any of her behavior, of course not. But now she is a homeless, single mother who has fled a painful and an oppressive situation. She is alone in the wilderness. We can only imagine, can't we, the, the weight of her heart, the anxiety of her mind. How, how is all this going to play out now? What will happen to me next? Is there any help or any hope to be found within all this? But verse 7, it's quite lovely. Notice it with me. The angel of the Lord found her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. 
This is the first time in the Bible, I think, that we encounter this interesting figure, the angel of the Lord. This figure appears occasionally at key moments in the life of the people of God, and it has to be said that there is a bit of a mystery surrounding the angel of the Lord. He's not simply an ordinary angel. Those who meet with the angel of the Lord feel that they have met with the Lord personally, and they have heard his voice. That's what Hagar herself feels from what we read in verse 13. And so we begin to speculate, we begin to wonder, we begin to ask, is the angel of the Lord really the Lord himself? Is this perhaps a pre-incarnate visitation from the second person of the Trinity, as many have suggested? Well, we don't know for sure. The Scriptures don't address all our speculations, but we do know that in the person of the angel of the Lord, the Lord comes to Hagar in a special way in that wilderness and meets with her. The, The Lord speaks to her, and the Lord reassures her. He begins by asking her, you know, where has she come from and where is she going? Not that he didn't know the answer. She is fleeing from Sarai. And in response to that, the angel of the Lord gives her both an instruction and a promise. Verse 9, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. And then he said, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. The Lord sends Hagar back to Abram's household, which might seem like a pretty tough thing in a way. But we have to remember the blessing of God does still rest upon this household and upon this family. Going back to the family of promise was to go back to the place of blessing. And we have to remember as well that Hagar needed the protection of a home. She needed food and safety and security. And the Lord says, go back. But with that instruction comes this very, very great promise. Hagar is going to be the matriarch of a great family. This outcast slave woman will have innumerable children of her own, so many that they cannot be numbered for the multitude, we're told. Now, the promise there, it has some echoes, doesn't it, of the promise made to Abram himself, which isn't all that surprising. This child is not going to be the child, the child through whom all the promises of God will come. Nonetheless, this is a son of Abram, and he's going to be the father of a huge family. He's going to be called Ishmael, and his name, it's it's going to have significance, verse 11, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. It's rather wonderful that the angel of the Lord breaks out into poetry at this point. That's why the format of the text changes. Often in the Bible, when a baby is coming, when a child is born, there are often words of poetic celebration. Even when a baby comes in the midst of trying circumstances, hard circumstances, that baby's arrival. It is a cause for celebration. That baby comes as a gift. And that's true, of course, today. That's always true, whatever the circumstances. But the name Ishmael, you see from the note at the bottom of the page there, it means God hears. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. Now, isn't that reassuring? Isn't that good? God has heard. That's going to be the meaning of the child's name. It's going to be the symbolic significance of his life. His mother was a servant, a a slave within a household where she was placed in an impossible situation, really an abusive situation. She was powerless within it. She had to flee. She was pregnant. She was alone with nowhere to turn. It's a tragic story that's been repeated, of course, in different guises in one form or another far too often. You can imagine Hagar weeping and despairing by that spring of water in the wilderness. She probably imagined that no one heard her cries or cared about her distress. But the Lord came near to her, and He came with a message. I've heard your cries. I've heard you in your distress. In fact, I am the God who hears. Hagar got the message, and so, verse 13, she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing, for she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy, which means the well of the living one who sees me. God is the God who hears when no one else hears. God is the God who sees when no one else sees. Well, we're going to have to pause the teaching right there. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and the first part of a message called The Cost of Self-Reliance. We're going to get back to this message next time, so I hope you make it a point to tune in. But whether you listen online or on the radio, it's all made possible because of your generosity. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, 
We want to say thank you by sending you a book called Everything a Child Should Know About God. It's our thank you gift for your support. You can find out more or give online when you come to EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884 or again, EncounterTheTruth.org. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.